Well, welcome everybody uh, to this RUSI annual security lecture. I'm Malcolm Chalmers. I'm the Deputy Director General uh, of RUSI, and it really is my great pleasure to welcome you all here. I'm sharing the stage uh, with Shashank Joshi, who is the Defence Editor of The Economist, who will be chairing the session and is indeed uh, an alumni of RUSI, as many of you here are actually, which is great to see. Uh, and our main speaker is Sir Jeremy Fleming, the director of GCHQ. We have had a, a tradition in Rusi for quite a number of years now of having an annual defense lecture uh, from uh, the current chief of the defense staff, which takes place uh, every December just before Christmas and reflects uh, Rusi's longstanding relationship uh, with Her Majesty's, His Majesty's armed forces and it's followed by a, a grand Christmas party uh, with mince pies and limitless uh, Rusi wine and indeed a choir. Uh, I can't guarantee you most of that uh, after this lecture but I, uh, there will be uh, drinks served in a, in a suitably uh, security safe environment right after uh, this uh, lecture uh, outside. Uh, but the fact that we're holding this lecture is an indication that uh, RUSI is about more than defense. Today, a very large part of our research is on other equally important aspects of the security agenda on financial crime, terror terrorism, organized crime, and of course, uh, cyber security. And I think it's especially important uh, to have that public profile, that public discussion of security issues because as I suspect Sir Jeremy will tell us uh, uh, shortly, effective national security in today's world means a broad public-private partnership across a whole range of areas. You can't tackle so many of the national security challenges our country faces without an active role uh, by various different parts of the private sector, the voluntary <coughs> sector, and so on. Government can't do it alone. The National Cyber Security Centre uh, with which Sir Jeremy was involved in establishing as an important indicator of that. So Shashank will cover in his remarks the rules of engagement for the lecture and subsequent Q&A, so I won't talk about that myself. All I would say by way of conclusion is that you have no doubt heard quite a bit about this lecture in the media uh, over the last uh, 24 hours, uh, understandably focused, I think, on, on latest developments latest horrific developments on the ground in Ukraine. Um, and uh, absolutely right. And uh, publicity is good publicity as far as Russia is concerned. So uh, that's, uh, that's really good news. But I suspect uh, that uh, Sir Jeremy's lecture will, ra ra will, will range rather more widely than current events in Ukraine. I hope it does. Because one of the biggest challenges government faces today in its integrated review for GCHQ and the other agencies, indeed for wider society, is how to confront the longer term, current, but also longer term issues in relation to the rise of China as a strategic rival and competitor, but also one with whom uh, we will continue to be bound by wide and complex uh, technological and economic ties, and of course, whose cooperation will be vital to tackle some of the biggest global issues of the day. So I'm really looking forward to hearing what Sir Jeremy says. And uh, as I indicated, Shashank will now explain uh, the format for the rest of our hour. Over to you, Shashank. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you all very much for joining us. Um, a few housekeeping rules before we uh, kick off, please. Some fairly obvious ones. This event is obviously on camera, uh, and it's on the record. Uh, so um, uh, just to remind you all of those rules, uh, the questions you ask, the answers we hear are all on the record. Um, a few more specific rules for this event. Uh, please don't publish photographs or media content of anyone wearing a red lanyard for, I think, reasons that will be staggeringly obvious. Um, uh, I think you can all see who they are. Please, please avoid that. Uh, so Jeremy is not wearing a red lanyard. He's, he's, he's fair game, but please black out his face if you, if you publish any photos. Um, electronic devices, please, uh, please turn them to silent. 
and I'll, I'll skip the obligatory joke about GCHQ doing that for you if you don't. Uh, uh, and uh, more prosaically, in the event of an emergency, the Science Gallery staff will direct people to the relevant fire exits. Right, with that out of the way, um, I'll hand over to Sir Jeremy in just a second. I'll just make one very basic introductory comment. I think it's interesting that uh, in a period of the biggest war in Europe for 30 years, the most consequential war in Europe for uh, uh, 70, 75 years, that the heads of all three agencies in the last several months have chosen to make quite substantial public interventions. And all of those have not really been about Russia. We saw Richard Moore talk in Aspen, Colorado, at the Aspen uh, uh, Institute's conference uh, about how uh, China was becoming his service's number one priority, uh, a remark he made uh, last year as well. I was then at Thames House a few months ago when I heard Ken McCullum alongside Christopher Wray, the director of the FBI, talk about uh, not Russian intelligence and the threat posed by Russian intelligence to the UK and its partners, uh, but to devote that entire intervention, I think his first major public UK intervention in that sort of setting, certainly alongside an FBI director, to the challenge posed by China, to UK intellectual property, academic freedom, uh, and a number of other issues. Uh, and now we have Sir Jeremy, who has already talked, I think, in the past extensively about China, again, here in this setting, uh, delivering, delivering for us a lecture that is about China. I think that says something quite profound about the trajectory of British foreign policy, uh, the China facing capabilities, the way they have evolved over the last several years. I think Sir Jeremy is the ideal person to talk to us about that. He took over as Director General of GCHQ in 2017. And uh, although he may not be able to say this, I think I can, in that five year period, the British government has turned its public facing approach to China drastically. Uh, from that we may remember in 2014, 2015, uh, before his arrival to the situation now where we have these uh, flagship public statements uh, warning of the threat from China in very, very stark terms. He started his career, his government career at MI5, where he oversaw that services uh, preparations for the London Olympics, um, uh, prepared work on the oversaw work on the contest strategy on counterterrorism. And at GCHQ, he's overseen a period of um, very significant flux, not just in terms of foreign policy priorities, also in terms of the establishment of the National Cyber Security Center, the NCSC, the defensive arm of GCHQ, uh, and also more recently, uh, its role with the national, uh, the establishment of the National Cyber Force, the NCF, the um, uh, unit tasked with offensive cyber activity, which has acquired more of a public profile in the last couple of years. Uh, and of course, the war in Ukraine has been a very, very busy time uh, for, for Sir Jeremy and his colleagues. Um, so uh, with that, uh, please join me in um, uh, welcoming Sir Jeremy to the stage. Uh, good afternoon. I'm sorry I'm not CDS. It sounds like he comes with better food. <laughs> but thank you, Shashank, and thank you, Malcolm, uh, for your kind introductions. And to Rusi, to inviting me to give this year's annual security lecture. Now, you don't need to be director of GCHQ to recognize that we're living through an incredibly difficult period. It's one where the threats we face as a nation are changing rapidly, probably at the fastest of any at time in my 30 years in the intelligence world. It's one where we're constantly rethinking what we mean when we say national security and what that means for our work. And the result is that, sadly, I'm spoiled for choice when I think about where to focus this lecture, the way in which different forms of extremism are coming to the fore the changes we've all felt living through the pandemic, the realization that resilience is now a completely different concept, the rise of cyber crime, President Putin's unprovoked war in Ukraine, the role of non-state actors in conflicts around the world, the so-called gray zone. And I could go on. But today, I want to focus on what I believe is the national security issue that will define our future. If you like, it's the James Webb telescope view as opposed to the binocular view. So I'm asking, if China is the question, then what is the answer? Now, everyone in this room understands that China has become once again a strong nation 
one that's investing in its education, developing its industries, growing modern digital and technical capabilities, building a capable military. In fact, a nation that is evolving into a superpower on its own terms. As it is for every nation, technological innovation is key to China's growth. And that's because it's so central to how we communicate, how we trade, how we work, and how we live. But it's also integral to intelligence, to military power, to cyber operations, to health security, to resilience, and of course, to economic growth. And as such, it's a provider of strategic advantage to those able to harness its potential. Now, China understands all that. It's deliberately and patiently set out to gain strategic advantage by shaping the world's technology ecosystems. So we need to ask ourselves, are we happy with that? At this point, I think it's important that I'm clear that we have no issue with the nation of China rising up to meet its potential. And we certainly have no issue with the people of China and the Chinese community who contribute hugely to life here in the UK. The UK wants to compete and to collaborate with a strong China. But it's how that strength is used or it's misused by the Chinese Communist Party that's at the heart of the issues we face. So we must also be clear that when it comes to technology, the politically motivated actions of the Chinese state is an increasingly urgent problem that we have to acknowledge and we have to address. And that's because it's changing the definition of national security into a much broader concept. A technology has become not just an area for opportunity, for competition and for collaboration. It's become a battlefield for control, for values and for influence. Of course, first and foremost, this is all about science and engineering. But ultimately, it's about our way of life. We and our like-minded allies see technology as a, a way to enable greater freedoms, greater prosperity, greater global collaboration, and yes, fair competition. But the Chinese leadership's approach is to also see it as a tool to gain advantage through control of their markets, of those in their sphere of influence, and of course, of their own citizens. And in an increasingly complex and interconnected world, we see this as a major risk to our future security and prosperity. And without the collective action of like-minded allies, the divergent values of the Chinese state, we believe, will be exported through technology. Without mindful choices today, we will sleepwalk into a future where technology limits our tomorrow instead of helping to release it. Now, you don't need the power of my metaphorical telescope or GCHQ's covert intelligence to see this happening or to know that that's a problem. Many of you will have heard me speak about cyber power. It was an attempt to provide a framework to, us, to explain how, in the cyber age, nations gain geopolitical and economic advantage. And we said this comes from their defense of their digital homelands, from their ability to contest and compete in cyberspace, and from the shaping of the digital rules of the road based on the rule of law and democratic values. And all of these elements are underpinned by the technology ecosystem that I've just touched on. And I think if, you, if we were to pause briefly on Ukraine for a moment, you can see this framework in action. Ukraine's resistance to the illegal Russian invasion is a result of their national unity. But that resistance also depends on their access to and mastery of advanced technology, the alliances and trust that enable that supply, and of course, impressive and agile cyber security. 
Now, that's a government-to-government -government thing. But it's reinforced by incredible and deep support from the private sector, especially from the big technology companies. Now, we're very proud of the role the UK played in Ukraine's defence. That's over a decade of UK and allied investment in cyber technologies and advanced equipment, together with a willingness to share intelligence to drive operations. It's enhancing Ukraine's security in real time. And it's redefining how cyber can be responsibly used. So far from the inevitable Russian military victory that their propaganda machines spouted, it's clear that Ukraine's courageous action on the battlefield and in cyberspace is turning the tide. Having failed in two major military strategies already, Putin's plan has hit the courageous reality of Ukrainian defense. With a little effective internal challenge, Putin's decision-making has proved flawed. Yesterday's attacks in Kyiv and across Ukraine are another example. It's a high-stakes strategy that is leading to strategic errors in judgment. Their gains are being reversed. Their, the costs to Russia in people and equipment are staggering. And we know, and Russian military commanders know, that their supplies and munition are running out. Russia's forces are exhausted. The use of prisoners as reinforcements and now the mobilization of tens of thousands of inexperienced conscripts speaks of a really desperate situation. And the Russian people have started to understand all of that too. They're seeing just how badly Putin has misjudged the situation. They're feeling the draft. They're, they're fleeing uh, the draft, realizing they can no longer travel. They know their access to modern technologies and external influences will be drastically restricted. And they're feeling the extent of the dreadful human cost of his war of choice. Now, wars are always partly decided by the application of technology. And one of the most important legacies of World War II was our, that our predecessors realized the power that comes from staying ahead in the technology race, of embracing global markets, global R&D, and global standards. The prosperity that followed fueled collective security, amazing new technologies, especially those that led to leaps in global connectivity and computer science underpinned underpinned incredible gains in living standards. I'd argue they also played a large part in enhancing the great alliances of our age, those that form the basis of what we know as the rules-based order. And they show that technology, security, economics, and statecraft are entangled and mutually dependent. Now, China benefited from all of these developments too. Their economic growth has been stellar since the country opened up in the 1970s. Millions of people have lifted themselves out of poverty. And that has been accompanied by equal growth in its science and technology. China has led the way in patent filings for the past decade. In 2019, the country accounted for 43% of the world's total patent applications, 11% of the UK's research output now includes Chinese authors. Now, with that financial and scientific muscle came an understanding from the Chinese leadership that if all arms of the state could be harnessed to accelerate this further, it would help sustain these incredible levels of growth. And it could be used to strengthen their military reach, to coerce those with different worldview, and of course, to maintain their control at home. And we see that approach playing out in the Chinese armed forces, their large and well-funded intelligence agencies, and increasingly in the way the Chinese state is projecting its interests beyond its immediate borders. Much of this is very public. 
declared strategies like the BRI, the Belt and Road Initiative, and the SRI, the Scientific Relations and Initiatives. But much is also undeclared. Using debt leverage, obfuscated investments in critical industries, old-fashioned spying to steal intellectual property and garner influence. Akem McCallum and Chris Ray talked about this in their joint speech earlier this year. And we're all seeing plenty of activity from the Chinese intelligence agencies. Now, taken together, overt and covert, we must conclude that Beijing is using all of the levers it has to challenge the international post-war consensus on economics and technology, and that it intends to rewrite the rules of international security, both close to home and further afield, in ways, frankly, that none of us have faced before. Now, there's an obvious paradox at play here. The Chinese leadership believes it draws its strength, its authority, from the closed one-party system. They seek to secure their advantage through scale and through control. This means they see opportunities to control the Chinese people rather than looking for ways to support and unleash the potential of their citizens. They see nations as either potential adversaries or potential client states to be threatened, bribed, or coerced. Now, the party has bet their future on this approach, shutting off the many alternative futures for the Chinese people in the process. They hope that future success based on this system will be inevitable. But underlying that be belief, and here's the paradox, is a sense of fear. A fear of its own citizens, of freedom of speech, free trade, open tech, tech standards and alliances, the whole open democratic order and the international rules-based system. It's therefore no surprise that while the Chinese nation has worked to build an advanced economy, the party has used its resources to implement draconian national security laws, a surveillance culture, and an increasingly increasingly aggressive military. And we're seeing that fear play out through the manipulation of the tech ecosystems which underpin our everyday lives. From monitoring its own citizens and restricting free speech to influencing financial systems and new domains. Now I think that's the wrong choice if you're serious about investing and building world-leading science and technology. And I know it's the wrong spot choice if you're serious about unleashing the potential of your people. Now, this plays out in the intelligence world, too. Uh, many of you will remember the debates we had in the UK almost a decade ago around the intelligence agency's license to operate. They centred on the need for greater transparency, and they led to the passing of new legislation, debates about the use of bulk data, stronger safeguards for individual privacy, deeper thinking about ethics. And we welcomed all of that debate. In Beijing, I believe that the leadership took away very different lessons from that time. I think they saw the potential of cyber to seize an advantage over their competitors or to clamp down on consent. They recognised they needed to bend international flows of data around the Indo-Pacific region towards interception platforms inside China. They sought to steal data from deep within the critical infrastructure of the countries across the, across, of countries across the world, especially those selling raw materials to Beijing, hosting allied military bases, or with industries competing with those owned by the party elite. Now in China, of course, there was no open debate on this new global surveillance system. Indeed, its targets were as much its own citizens as other nations. They saw an opportunity to bolster the Great Firewall, to restrict free speech, and to throttle the growth of Western tech firms by slowing and blocking their services. And today, that surveillance system appears ever more established. And we think it's dangerous. 
Now, much of this is also playing out beyond China's own borders and in the way they're seeking to subvert global security standards in a bid for more control. Now, to see what's at stake here, you only need to look at the new IP standards that China put to the International Telecommunications Union, the ITU, in 2018. Now, this appeared to come from Chinese industry, but the hand of the Chinese state was very clear. Major Chinese tech companies are rarely allowed to move in this space without direction from the party. Now, new IP's pro proponents portray it as a revolutionary system that will prepare the internet for the future. But we could see it would fundamentally change some of the principles which underpin the internet. And we think it would reduce interoperability and therefore increase the fragmentation of systems. It would cause a move away from the multi-stakeholder model towards greater government control and tracking with all that implies for human rights. Now, thankfully, this proposal has not taken root in the ITU, and the UK had a role in this. But it won't be the end of the story. We can see many other proposals in many other standards bodies. So together with our allies, we need to remain alert to make sure that these ideas don't take root elsewhere. Now, control is also a major driver for Beijing as it seeks to build a centralised digital currency. Yes, it introduces efficiencies and new ways of settling payments, but the way it's being implemented allows the monitoring of citizens and it forces companies to use the service. It might, in future, also enable China to partially evade the sorts of international sanctions currently being applied to Putin's regime in Russia. And, and be in doubt, by the way, the Chinese Communist Party is learning the lessons from that conflict. And we're even seeing how that fear and desire, desire for control affects new domains like space. China's development of the Baidou satellite system, a rival alternative to the established GPS network, is moving quickly. It's providing navigation to aircraft, submarines, missiles, and commercial services. And the party has used every lever to force Chinese citizens and businesses to adopt it. And for it to be built into Chinese exports to more than 120 countries now around the world. Now, on its own, this might just feel like sharp elbowed competition. But if we price in the motivations I've been describing, you can see it's part of a concerted strategy. And many also believe that China is building a powerful anti-satellite capability with a doctrine of denying other nations access to space in the event of a conflict. There are obvious fears that this technology could be used to track individuals too. So where does that leave us? Perhaps the Chinese Communist Party is right. Perhaps that is the future of strength in the 21st century. But I don't agree. In the longer run, control is no substitute for the advantage that comes from empowered citizens, open societies and standards, secure alliances. Nonetheless, that paradox of great strength combined with fear is driving China into actions that could represent a huge threat to us all. Now, I count myself lucky to live in a free, democratic society, open for global trade, with truly collaborative global partnerships. While the Communist Party in China see weakness in how we choose to live, we know that this is, in fact, the source of our strength. And I believe that it's by leaning into this difference that we can prosper and find that answer to the question of China. So what are our strengths that set us apart? Well, firstly, we see the value in collaboration. We're a nation of innovators. We invest in science. We host 
world-leading academic institutions. We encourage and value expertise, and we're not afraid to share any of this with the world. Secondly, we're a rule-making nation. The UK has deep experience of setting workable international tech standards informed by open democratic values. And we're at the heart of the international and allied efforts to make them stick in a really harsh geopolitical world. Thirdly, we've got a strong legislative and policy framework which we use to protect technology and markets. Through the National Security and Investment Act and other legislation, government has new powers to intervene in transactions that pose risks to our national security. But it's not all about protection. We're also investing heavily in emerging tech startups, including through the National Security Strategic Investment Fund, to gain the benefits of innovation and make sure that they don't fall for the promise of alternative cheap capital. Fourthly, we've responsible and powerful national institutions with the capabilities and the experience to actively take on the threats to, national, to our national interest. And that goes for our covert work too. Wherever we act, including in new operational areas, uh, like those undertaken by the National Cyber Force, we do so in accordance with international law and our own domestic legislation. It's an ethical, proportionate, and legal approach that really does set us apart from our adversaries. And lastly, we have deep and enduring international partnerships based on mutual interest and shared values. Where we and other like-minded nations collaborate to enable greater security and prosperity, authoritarian states use each other only when it's in their own interest to do so. So these strengths give us great foundation for action. And from where I sit, I think we need to continue to make deep investments in the next generation of key national security technologies. For example, we know our security and prosperity will depend on mastering quantum capabilities, systems which are exponentially more powerful than our current digital technologies and that push at the edge of known physics. These are on the horizon and they may be closer than we think. And our companies, universities and intelligence agencies cannot afford to be, to, to be late to that quantum revolution or be relaxed about the extent to which others, especially perhaps those in China, are watching our progress. So we must continue deep engagement with the global market whilst recognizing the risks this brings. The manufacture of advanced semiconductor chips is an obvious case in point. They enable everything today from our smartphones to the advanced weapons that are being used to defend Ukraine. And Taiwan, of course, has patiently invested in their semiconductor manufacture, and it now supplies the world. And in the UK, we cannot recreate the scale of their manufacturing capabilities. So as a result, events in the Taiwan Straits, any risk to that vital supply chain, have the potential to directly impact the resilience of the UK and global future growth. And that's just one example of why the UK tilted its national security and defense efforts towards the Indo-Pacific in the 2021 integrated review. To be resilient at home, we have to be resilient globally. And that, of course, means working very closely with our allies. Now, some nations don't know which way to face. And for them, we must continue to offer a credible alternative so that they can retain their sovereignty in technology and their national security. And many are looking on with concern at China's actions around the world. For example, in the Solomon Islands, they see huge Chinese loans paying for Chinese technology upgrades. They see countries reaching deals with serious strings attached. 
This may be the offer of new technologies like smart cities, which have the potential to export surveillance and data, or there might be demands for new bilateral security treaties. Mortgaging the future by buying into the Chinese vision for technology may be attractive to some in the short term, particularly for those nations suffering the stress of high energy and food costs, which have resulted from the Russia's invasion of Ukraine. So we need to offer alternative solutions that are practical, that are affordable, and that are, back, are, are backed by international funding or market investment. And if we don't, in the longer term, the hidden costs of China's cheap technology solutions will become very obvious. Now, in a future crisis, Beijing could exploit information covertly extracted from client economies and governments or use its monopolies to demand compliance in international fora. And to catch a glimpse of that future, one only needs to look at how China has already sought to do this, leveraging its influence over many smaller nations in votes over technology, ethics, and foreign policy. So if China is the question, and science and technology is part of the answer, what should we do next? Our task as a community is to understand the challenge, to know that Chinese tech domination is not inevitable, to take action. So my ask of all of you is to think the on, beyond the illusion of the inevitable, to lean into the strengths we have as a nation to develop ethical approaches and collaborative partnerships, and to recognize that creating an alternative, competitive, and compelling offer for technology is an opportunity for the whole of society that we can't afford to miss. And across the UK, we need businesses and academia to be alive to the threat I've described today and to make the choices, make choices accordingly. And while governments can set the conditions, this isn't about a single grand plan. I think this is going to play out in your boardrooms, in your labs, in your team meetings evening, even. You should be protecting your systems and your intellectual property. You should actively manage the potential threat in your dealings with China. The seemingly small daily choices around cyber investment, IP protection, and more, they all really matter. Now, across the world, our allies are clear-eyed about the threat. And together, both at the nation-state level and with the private sector, I know that we can offer credible alternatives. This isn't a call to exclude or marginalize China, even if we could. It's a call for China to recognize that it's to its advantage to play responsibly inside the global system. If it does so, it can help to co-create the rules of tomorrow. But if it chooses not to, to play a disruptive role in international security, technology, and markets, then that will come at a cost too. Now, these are all massive geopolitical issues and choices, and I think their resolution will define our age. My organization will do all it can to contribute within its remit, especially to bring together interested parties. And we can see three particular strands of work. Firstly, understanding the risks and threats posed by Beijing's tech policies. You know, what are the partnerships, architectures, and norms that we need to enable the open, democratic, national security community? Secondly, enhancing the collective offer from industry to protect and shape technologies, generate compelling alternatives, and enable the next generation of international standards. And finally, investing more heavily in the technologies where we must maintain an advantage if we're serious about seizing the big opportunities for security and growth. <coughs> now, at GCHQ, it's our privilege and duty to help the nation navigate the sliding door moments of history. This feels like one of those times. 
our future strategic tech advantage rests on what we do as a community next. I'm confident that together we can tilt that in our collective favour. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sir Jeremy. I'm going to ask um, a couple of questions. We'll have a short conversation here. Uh, we're, we're a little bit over time. We have about 20 minutes left, so I'll, I'll be very brief, and then I'll throw it open to the floor, but also uh, try and involve our um, virtual audience who are listening to this as well. Um, just to start with, a lot of your remarks were diagnostic. You were analysing the problem, setting it out, uh, and you had some suggestions on the necessary response, and you called for the need for alternative solutions. You said they have to be practical, they have to be affordable, they have to be backed by international funding or market investment. Uh, my question is a fairly simple one, which is, have we ever done that? Are there any examples of us ever having been successful in that effort? Or is this, you know, terra nova as we, as we compete with the Chinese? I can see where we've done aspects of it. So if you, if you look at some of the support that the UK has provided for the rollout of fibre in Africa, uh, cloud technology in, in Africa and some of the analytical and telecommunications capabilities that go on the top of that. That's been a major effort. It's been very well funded by the, by the UK um, uh, uh, government. But I think the issue is uh, not on the technologies we already have on the table in front of us. It's those that we see coming down the track towards us. My, my uh, proposition is that if we're serious about our prosperity and our security, then we need to take a very long-range view. And uh, the UK has great tech and scientific strength. We, we count ourselves as a great uh, science power. And so when we look to where those strengths are, whether that's bioscience or it's quantum or, or, or uh, aspects of, uh, other aspects of computer science, then those are the technologies we need to double down on. And those are the technologies we need to put a wrap around. Um, uh, if I was to go into um, artificial intelligence in a little bit more uh, detail, you know, we are world leading in a lot of the capability around that. Uh, we're world leading in the research, which is um, allowing uh, the capabilities to use less data for protect privacy more to develop um, uh, a, a mean, meaning, meaningful um, uh, offer for the future. We're world leading in some of the applications around um, lower power use on chips, for example, which will enable the running of those AI uh, um, uh, algorithms. I could, I could go on. So I think, I think whilst we, we can point to some areas where we've done it successfully, the, the call is to rally against a future vision of where we should be. I want to just add one more point, which is to reflect on the countries you've talked about looking both ways, or perhaps those that are ambivalent. There are countries that are uh, in China's orbit, there are those that potentially could be in its orbit, and there are those that are friendly with us but don't share our perspective on all of these things down to the letter. I'm thinking of countries like India here, which have their own very distinctive views on privacy, data localization, uh, the balance between individual liberties and state power, which differs in many ways from those you'd find in Western Europe. I'm interested not just in where the common ground is, but what compromises and adjustments and accommodations we may have to make. Because dealing with your Indias and Mexicos and, and Indonesias may be different to dealing with the Five Eyes and our NATO partners. What, what impact does that have on your work? There is, there is no, if, if you are, uh, let, let's, let's talk about the internet. So if you were to um, uh, run that question over, over the internet, then you would, you would say that there has never been a single version of the internet. But what the, what the internet has had is a shared view of its underpinning standards. And, and that has been developed over many decades now with, with widespread um, international agreement and input from both the private, mostly from the private sector and, and academia, actually, and, and, and in some cases from, uh, from governments. Um, uh, irrespective of whether you're a country that aligns with the UK and, and our allies, uh, you have benefited uh, from that, from that standardisation and from the ability to, to trade with certainty, trusting the technology that underpins it. Now, um, if, if you, uh, irrespective of whether you, you agree, agree with the UK stance, if you are content to, uh, to look to a future where the standards underpinning that sort of technology are not ones that you can assure, 
They are not ones that you are able to um, uh, understand the underpinning technologies, and you have serious doubts about aspects of uh, maybe all or some of the values that you know have, um, have been in the context within which they're produced, then I think that's a worse situation for, for you. So I don't, I don't think anyone is calling here for a ubiquitous um, uh, approach to all of these issues. We need, of course, for innovation, uh, for prosperity, and to reflect our regional context to be able to exercise some difference. But some things need to be standardised, and some things, I think, need to withstand that sort of broader scrutiny from a te technical and from a values perspective. Okay, lovely, thank you very much. Um, if you could please raise your hands if you have a question. I will try and bring in people from across, but also from the uh, virtual audience. Um, uh, over there, please, gentlemen in the blazer. And if you could please state your uh, uh, name affiliation, because we may know who you are, but the di virtual audience may not, so we'd appreciate that. Dominic Connor, I write for the Register. Um, I'm interested in why the Russian, the threatened Russian attacks, cyber attacks that we were promised if anything bad happened, have basically been at the level of student pranks. Um, what, what does that tell us about you know, estimating the capabilities of other countries? And is, is there worse to come? I'm, I'm wondering which aspect most vehemently to disagree with in that question. <laughs> so, um, so Russia is an incredibly capable cyber actor and has shown it is so over, over many years. Um, uh, most recently, of, of course, allies have called out uh, Russian and uh, Chinese activities over the last 12 months that have gone into um, exploited uh, malware with a global impact and uh, have the ability to collect in intelligence and the, the impact of that, I think, has been very obvious to, to everyone. So they are extremely um, uh, capable. I think the, the, qu the question is, to what extent have we seen cyber in the context of this conflict? And, and the answer to that is, we, we've seen a lot of cyber in this uh, conflict. We, we just haven't seen the film version of it. You know, the, the cyber Ar Armageddon, the, the big red button that switched off everything all at once. And, and the, the reality is that, of course, that's not how these things play out. And so we, we saw um, cyber activity from Russia in the weeks running up to their, their illegal uh, invasion. We saw cyber activity, which um, had actually had quite a broad uh, impact, including on the periphery of Ukraine, uh, against Viasat immediately after their invasions. And, and if you were sat in uh, Kyiv at the moment and you were responsible for uh, that, that government cyber security, you, you would be thinking that, Russia is paying very close attention to your government and your system. So, so I think there's, um, there's been a lot, a lot of cyber. Uh, I think academically, um, uh, we're learning a lot of lessons about how cyber fits with other domains in a conflict-like situation. And of course, we're not the only ones learning that lesson. I alluded to it um, in the speech. And so when we're, when we're thinking about what uh, China might be learning from, uh, from Ukraine, then how to brigade cyber capabilities alongside all other aspects of a, a, a conflict, I think is probably an area of, of very uh, ripe research. And I, I've no doubt Rusi will be thinking hard about this too. Um, I'd like to channel a question from our audience, uh, from our virtual audience, uh, uh, from a mysteriously named BP, who hasn't specified his name, but uh, uh, perhaps works for the Chinese embassy. Uh, what impact does... Uh, I, I think it's really interesting because your, your speech was about sort of uh, advanced technologies, and we think of these in sort of start-up and, and in the intellectual side of it. The question is, what impact does resource and raw material control impact the future of the semiconductor industries, including quantum computing, what can be done to reduce constriction of these? And I think that's interesting because we, we perhaps the material, you know, hard, tangible side of this is, is, is seen as less important than the intellectual property. Well, it's, it's extremely interesting. And of course, what it, what it says is that technology never sits on its own. You know, if I, if uh, a GCHQ as an agency is often thought of as a, a technology agency, the truth is it's a it's a, uh, it's a people agency and brilliant people working with technology with partners uh, within a context to make a difference to our national security to keep us safe. And, uh, and of course, when you're thinking about that broader tech ecosystem, then the, 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 the physical tech is an important part of it. But, but you've also got comp around that the question of skills. Do we have the skills that are sufficient to make the most of that technology for the next uh, generation? And you've got questions around the resilience of the supply for the manufacture 
of those uh, capabilities. Um, the, the very widespread debate about the availability of uh, rare earth materials and, and certain un other underpinning uh, materials. Uh, none of that is particularly new as it happens. Mm. But I don't think it's been very widely understood, and certainly we haven't gone far enough in, in making sure that we completely understand the implications for alternative sources of supply. Uh, uh, strangely enough, I think it is one of the positive outcomes from the pandemic that nations are all thinking differently about resilience. And that includes all sorts of supply chains. I'd put that in that, in, in that camp too. Thank you. Um, I had a question over there, and also, if it's okay, Deborah Haynes over there, but uh, next to you I can spot uh, Sir John Scarlett, and I wonder if it's okay uh, to, to pick on you up to, after Deborah to get your view, because it would be very, very useful to have a human intelligence perspective on some of these themes. I hope you don't mind me my picking on you afterwards as well. Um, thank you. Um, as Russia runs down its stockpiles of conventional weapons, and with Vladimir Putin showing no sign of backing down, in your opinion, does the risk of Russia resorting to a nuclear strike increase? And has GCHQ seen any tangible evidence of that being prepared beyond the rhetoric? And if I may, um, you talk about Russia running out of weapons. Is there a risk of the UK and European allies in particular running out of weapons to support Ukraine first? I think there are three, three questions in there, aren't there? Um, so I've said in this speech that, that Russia is running low on its conventional munitions and that its commanders know that is the, the case, and I completely um, stand by, by that. And the question is, I think, whether what we're um, are seeing uh, because of that situation, indeed what we've seen in the last day or so with the, with the, uh, the, the strikes once again across Kyiv and uh, the rest of Ukraine, whether that is escalatory in its own right. And I think there's a, there's a deep question around all of that. And I have to say it's a very concerning uh, time for, for everyone as we think about, not least, of course, the, the Ukrainians who are suffering the dreadful brunt of, of that um, aggression. My view is what we saw yesterday um, was, uh, was an escalation in terms of a return to that sort of targeted strike, much of it against critical national infrastructure, but it, but it wasn't an escalation in terms of the types of weapons that are, are being uh, used or the extent to which those weapons are bounded with inside, inside that, um, act, that conflict. So in that way, it continues to follow the, the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the shape, the framework that we've had of the conflict so far. Now, Russia is the only nation, of course, talking about using nuclear weapons. And I have to say that's extremely dangerous to do so. And uh, we, we have, have gone on record, I'm on record, and, and, uh, and many friendly nations are already on record and saying that to, to even be talking about the use of, possible use of tactical nuclear weapons is, is, is a very dangerous thing to do. And if, if, it is, if there really is contemplation about their use, then you know, that would be catastrophic and there would be... Um, uh, serious repercussions from, uh, uh, from that. Um, I think your third question is, would we spot it? And uh, I, I would like to think that with our allies, uh, we would have a good chance at spotting it, but of course there are never any guarantees in, uh, in this space. M m my view is, for the moment, that uh, Russian, Russian doctrine and President Putin's approach to this war would see that being, a, a, you know, hopefully a long way off. Uh, but I think we all need to be concerned about the rhetoric. Sir John. <coughs> right, well, thank you for the opportunity. I didn't put my hand up. Um, <coughs> uh, if I could, uh, you say from a human intelligence point of view, uh, I am wary of drawing too much of a distinction between human intelligence and other forms of intelligence. It's all mixed up. You know, you inform each other, and certainly our intelligence community does do that. Um, so, you know, let, let's not you know, put down too many d dividing lines. Um, I think certainly when I'm looking at it, and I'm thinking maybe with a human intelligence background, um, um, the questions I'm asking myself, the first one really is I need absolutely to be clear in the Ukraine context, this is, of what Russian objectives are. Uh, and that, that, of course, is you know, getting into the mind of uh, the other side, if you like, which is the classic definition, uh, maybe, of uh, intelligence tasking. And if you can be clear about that, uh, and there's a quite a wide consensus that it is effectively take over control of Ukraine. 
and uh, in the immediate term or in the longer term, but that objective remains there. Then, of course, you can follow through on, um, on you know, what we can expect to happen in the period immediately ahead and the period long ahead. And uh, I think we are all saying, really, um, and I'm agreeing, that this is going to go on for quite some time. And there's a very heavy um, commitment there on uh, the Russian side, and they are prepared to take very strong action to back up um, their um, objectives. So that means a lot, including, of course, in terms of destruction and casualties and, uh, and, uh, and, and so on. Um, secondly, we've touched on the, or we've also touched on the, the nuclear point there. I would, I would very much support uh, what Jeremy was saying. Um, there just is worth noting what you know, Putin is talking about, you know, nuclear threats, where he's talking about it, but it's always worth watching the language that he's using in his public statements. And they do, he has so far, unless somebody corrects me, avoided uh, a direct connection, you know, a specific threat. If you invade this particular oblast, then, you know, I'm going to drop uh, a tactical nuclear weapon on you. He hasn't said that. So it's up there in the, in the atmosphere uh, as a concept and as an idea, um, uh, but it, it hasn't actually come down to a completely specific threat on a particular target area. And of course, there's a fine distinction, but it's just worth making, uh, making that point. We need to be careful because we're talking an awful lot about escalation. And escalation seems to mean nuclear, but of course, it can mean a lot of other things too. Uh, and we have to remember that. And indeed, we're seeing that today in Kiev, for example. Thirdly, I'd mention uh, cyber because that came up in the questions. Um, and um, I don't think I'm, well, I'm not saying anything I shouldn't say because Lindy Cameron has already said it, uh, that uh, the uh, skill and, and commitment and expertise which is there in the defences and the resilience which the Ukrainian authorities have developed over quite a few years now in terms of cyber defence has proved to be effective. I mean, obviously not completely effective, but it's certainly been relatively um, effective. And that's a lesson to be drawn, and it's quite right that she said that, that really well-developed defence, resilience, and then international partnerships, of course, and support, which has come to Ukraine from, uh, from the outside. So those are three, you know, or some particular uh, points that, um, that I flag up. Thanks very much. Um, I want to channel a couple of questions from here because there are a few that touch on uh, a similar theme of Chinese investment uh, in the UK and uh, our universities and us and students. Um, so, for example, someone has asked about uh, over 114,000 Chinese students studying in the UK. Uh, you were quite clear, that, you know, and you've been clear in the past that your, your issue is not with Chinese people, the Chinese community and Chinese students. But in the US, we have seen uh, uh, real concern in the national security community about the impact that such high student numbers may have uh, on security concerns. We've also had a question about uh, UK universities collaborating with Chinese entities, including in sensitive areas. Are, are these things, is the mood changing in, in Whitehall on some of these issues? Is, is your approach this different to how it was a year or a couple of years ago? I, I think the mood has changed over the last couple of years and uh, m many arms of of the UK government, including my own National Cyber Security Centre, including the Centre of Protection of Critical Infrastructure, CPNI, in, uh, in MI5 and, uh, and, and others, have provided advice to academia on how to, how to navigate some of these uh, tricky issues. My, my personal view is that we should continue to welcome students uh, uh, from China. We, could, we should continue to seek the benefits from that sort of collaboration but we should be really clear about where we want that to be the case. Uh, we should be really clear on the areas of technology where we would require additional safeguards if that was going to work um, uh, properly. And we should be really clear with the Chinese state about why that's the case. And then I, I'm, I'm after a, a much more grown-up conversation about what it is we really want to protect, what needs to be sovereign, what we're happy to work with our allies, and where, frankly, we, we are willing to uh, collaborate. You know, the, the, the sweet spot here is, is, uh, is ongoing, strong economic and academic scientific collaboration with China, but, but on terms that we both agree, <laughs> and, and it's not in that place at the moment. 
Are there any priority areas that you would warn universities about um, as terms of not being in that sweet spot, not having that balance? Are there any areas that are of particular concern? I've listed some of the technologies where I think we have a, a, wor a genuine world lead at the moment. And, and some of those are areas we want to collaborate on and some aren't. But it's, it's very, it, it, it will come down to aspects of technology areas rather than whole technology areas. It'll come down to the way in which our allies perceive some, some of those um, uh, technologies. I, I happen to think that for key aspects of quantum and artificial intelligence, we have to be quite precise and more precise than we are at the moment. Thank you very much. Uh, we've run out of time, so I apologise to all those on the floor who I couldn't get to. Um, it's been a really thoughtful lecture. It's really interesting remarks, very interesting Q&A session. I think what's become very clear is um, the, the trend I described at the beginning uh, and the focus on China, the focus in the integrated review on China-facing capabilities, this isn't going away. Uh, you're doubling down on this. Um, we have a refresh of the integrated review coming up very shortly. It'll be very interesting to see what that says on these issues, but it certainly sounds, from what you've said, like it's going to preserve that uh, strong focus on science and technology. Uh, it's not going to shy away from China questions just because of the war in Europe. Uh, and we look forward to your next uh, intervention on these remarks. So thank you very much, and please join me again in thanking Sir Jeremy Fleming. <laughs>